The Thinking Tackle Podcast. Welcome to the Thinking Tackle Podcast. Today's guest is one of carp fishing's most colourful and knowledgeable characters. He's had tremendous success both fishing at home and across Europe. He's also the author of the book Every Bit of Blue. He was a previous guest on episode 26 of the podcast. Frank Warwick, welcome to the show. Hey, so nice to see you, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad, Frank. Thanks for coming back on the show. It seems a while now, doesn't it, since our last podcast? Yeah, a lot has happened since then. It's been uh, it's been quite an exciting time, you know. And I'll tell you what, I've had so many nice compliments about the, the show. And we were worried about it, weren't we? We were a little bit concerned, weren't we? Yeah, because we thought we'd gone off at too many tangents and didn't talk about fishing hardly, didn't we? And, uh... Well, that's what we've learned about Frank, Tobe, as well, isn't it? That... Um, you don't you, you don't have a format for a show when you talk to Frank. It's like you you, you kind of just see where it goes. You just let it do its own thing. It's spontaneous. That's, that's the best way though, isn't it? Surely because if it was all predictable and it's like you know talking about just one water and all, I guess boring, doesn't it? You know, I think these things are about seeing what the characters like that you that, you know that you're talking to. I mean, I'm sure. Uh, Joe Rogan doesn't know what's coming with some of his guests. You know, I think that's the best way, though. I think Joe Rogan as well uses other substances as well to... Uh, uh, to... Well, he does. He sits there smoking cannabis <laughs> yeah. and doing all sorts of shit, doesn't we, he? We, we watched one with Mike Tyson earlier as well, didn't we? Yeah, with the mushrooms. Yeah. yeah. He, just, yeah. he just stuck a load of mushrooms in his mouth. And, uh, yeah. But I mean, yeah. Why, why do you think... I mean, you don't necessarily sit around thinking too much about this, Frank, but... Are you surprised at your popularity? Because that podcast, I mean, it was one of our most successful podcasts last year. Too. That's what I was just going to say. You were, you be quickly became one of our most highly sought after guests to come back on. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's mad, isn't it? I, I just don't see it coming, really. You know, I know uh, I'm probably a little bit different. I think it's about previous exposure as well, in, in a kind of way. Because I think you can be overexposed, you know, uh, because... I think there's a bit of intrigue with somebody. And as soon as you start pe- like an onion, as soon as you've peeled all the layers back, it's kind of uh, completely different, isn't it? So I think, I think with you as well is that there are so many layers to peel back as well. You, you, never, you yeah. never hear the same stuff twice. And I think people, they just don't know what we're going to talk about next. I mean, we could be talking about premonitions one minute and then flora pop-ups the next. It's just, you yeah. know... And you're so insightful with it as well, I think. Um, yeah. So there's a bit of everything with it, I think. Yeah. Well, I think variety is the spice of life, you know. I mean, some of the best uh, conversations I have on the bank and that are more memorable ones. You know, we didn't expect it to happen. It was just sort of, oh, I'll tell you, I've got to tell you this story, you know. It's just reminded me of one. Do you mind if I do tell it? Yeah, go for it. Well, I was, I was filming in... Uh, Basically, we went over to Parco for the first time, and Henrik Hansen is a very good friend of mine. He's one of my best mates. He's a, a, a Dane that lives in Norway. He married a Norwegian bird and moved to Norway in the middle of bloody nowhere, you know. And he's mad on carp fishing, and he he was a bit of a fan of mine, if you like. And uh, he got in touch with me, and he asked me to go to Parco de la Brenta as his guest. He was going with a, a few close friends. So... I didn't know what to expect, so I, I flew over there. And uh, Henrik's a bit of a laugh, and he he had a cameraman with him. Uh, we'll call him Henrik Johansson. Is I call him Henrik One and Henrik Two, and Henrik Johansson, the, the cameraman, was a very sort of cerebral guy, you know, dead dead intelligent and uh, able to edit films, do beautiful stuff. I mean, he he works for the Norwegian government. And it was wasted, really, because he should have been making proper films. It's like, you know, David Lean-style stuff. Anyway, Henrik was dead good fun. And during the week, we got really, you know, we had some right laughs. We had the whiskey out and everything, getting pissed up. But of a night time, not pissed up, but, you know, having, having a few. And Henrik was very reserved, the cameraman. And gradually, as the week went on, he got used to my sense of humour and my, me as a person, you know. <laughs> And he sat there, and we were looking at the stars one night. We had, a, we had a big malt whiskey piece in our hand. And he goes, yes, Frank. He said, I'm a, a very heavy thinker, you know, my friend. He says, it takes me more more than four or five days to really learn what who the real Frank Warwick is. He said, uh, 
Yes, he said, uh, I'm a very deep guy. He said, I like to disappear deep inside myself. I said, uh, oh, I tried that. I says, but my coat wasn't long enough. <laughs> so, <laughs> Didn't we have a similar one? Did we, did we hear that in the last show or something similar to that, wasn't it? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Henrik Hansen, where do I know that name from anyway? Sorry. I recognise... He's, uh, well, what he is, he's... Uh, He's slightly eccentric. He's a bit like me, I guess. And he, he used to own a company called Northern Bates. Right. And he okay. he's all over social media. He's, he's an incredible guy, you know. Frank, he's what he's did, endless. What did, what did he say after you told him that joke? Well, we, we pissed ourselves laughing. It was hilarious, <laughs> you know. It was hilarious. I mean, that's the, the way my mind works, you know. It's crazy. He was having a special sort of moment where he was being <laughs> philosophical and that. and. Uh, did, did I tell you about, I don't know if I mentioned it in the last one, but when they were driving down to meet me uh, near near the airport in Venice, so I stayed in a hotel and they were arriving late. I think I did mention this. So I says to the young bit of stuff, she was an absolute drop-dead gorgeous Italian bird on the reception. I said, uh, I've got two friends coming from, from Norway. They're driving down. I said, they're knackered. I said, could... I said, they've only just got married. Can, have you got a honeymoon suite? I can book a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you can imagine the face. <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, talking about women, actually, we were looking through our YouTube earlier today, weren't we? Oh, yeah, Frank, we've done some... Uh, yeah, a yeah, little bit of research, <laughs> yeah. We came across you and um, a, an American girl. What, were you in Italy or something? And this girl came out to fish with you for a week or something before oh, the World no, Angling Championships. Romania. That was in Romania. Romania. Well, she, was, she was as mad as a snake, her. Huh? Was she? What happened, what happened was, I, I used to work for uh, Radu Mora, and he... He owns. He's a Romanian that's got a TV company in uh, in uh, the middle of. Oh, what's it called? The capital, bloody Hungary, Budapest. Yeah. So Radu was a hell of a character. What we used to do, he he used to make. He made an, a job for me, if you like. I used to get about one and a half grand a month to fly to Budapest, make some programs in the TV studios, and do a bit of fishing. And then one day, he uh, I says, Radu, what do you do in the other part of the TV studios? He said, oh, we, we, I have uh, a lot of porn channels. I knew you were going to say that. I just so I said, really? <laughs> he says, yeah. So he says, you want to see what goes on? He says, I have the hunting and fishing channel and another <laughs> channel that's sort of outdoor stuff. And then he, he took me down and into, the, into one of his... Other studios, there was loads of it going on. I couldn't believe it. And there was this young stud in there with two check birds, sort of uh, multitasking, let's put it like. <laughs> so, so I was watching, like, you know, I went, Jesus Christ. I says, can you imagine his face on a Monday morning? Everyone's as miserable as fuck on the way to work. And he's thinking... <laughs> <laughs> he's living the dream, isn't he? Yeah. Yeah, I thought... Yeah, he's living this dream. He's living, getting paid for it. Do we, but, um, do we dare ask what else you saw down there? Uh, I, d I, I was stood up at the time, I must add, when Toby's saying, well, what else did you see down there? <laughs> oh, yeah, it was, it was a bullet eye view. <laughs> <laughs> Dave Rad, says to me, he says, would you like to do this? I says, I'm in the wrong job here, aren't yeah. I? I said, the... I says, no, I said, it wouldn't be very good for my career. This would he says, you can wear a monkey mask. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, thanks, Rad. I'll pass on that one. Thank you very much. But uh, yeah, it was a bit different. God, you meet and some then, people, uh, don't you? So sorry, yeah, where, well, so where did this American girl come into all of this anyway? Well, Radu, Radu, he's, he's a... He likes loads of views on his, on his uh, pay-per-view TV. So he goes, what about this uh, American uh, bint? I says, mate, she she's she knows all about fishing. I says, she's brain dead. I'm not being rude, it's true. And uh, I says, she, she looks eye candy. Well, that's about it. So she's got about 20 million followers in the hunting game. She does shooting and I've all that. that. I'm yeah. not mad on that, I'll be mm. honest with you. Mm. So he says, I'm going to sponsor you to do the, uh, the tanker best match. And there was 10,000 quid on it. And I was leading it the year previous from a crap swim, nearly won it, but I'm sure they stitched me up. 
I think the money's not leaving Romania. You know what I'm saying? Right. I think you could you could have 50 fish and be in front of you, lose it in the last 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it was one of them. Anyway, he said, yeah, for the cameras, because we're making a film about it, I want you to have her in your team. It's teams of three. And uh, what the other person, uh, sadly, was uh, a bloke called Jason Can. So they were made for each of them, so it was amazing. Anyway, yeah. Uh, well, I saw those two dancing with each other and everything. They were they were getting yeah, on pretty yeah. well, weren't they? Yeah, let's not even go there, buddy. It was one of them, you know. Well, anyway, let's, let's go there, Frank, shall we? <laughs> yeah, well, the, the TV cameras came down and did an interview with her. And she goes, oh, I'm really getting the hang of this fishing thing. She says, I've just got myself a two and three quarter pound test curve reel. <laughs> So I'm like, that. oh, for fuck's sake. You know, it was like, that was just the start of it. And I thought, you know, this isn't TV gold, this. It's like uh, some out of the Benny Hill show. So, uh, yeah, I ran away, really. I went and seen Rob Hughes and Bart. You know, they were down the bank pissing themselves at some of the antics. Then they started doing ballroom dancing in the swim. I mean, you can Google this on... on uh, it's on YouTube, YouTube. yeah. Yeah. But so, so, sure so who did she, who did she replace then, Frank? Who who was gonna who was gonna be the third angler then? Well, it was Jason Cam. Right. So, I you know it was one of them things that I sort of thought you know you, you break out in a sweat and you sort of thinking how did this happen? Yeah. You know it was one of them. And then she's that woman that got the most hate mail of any person in 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 in, in America, I think. She was that one that ended up on a small island in Scotland shooting a goat. Mm. And she she was there with it, you know. And uh, she's also shot giraffes. Yeah. Things like that. You I, know. I saw, I, yeah, because I went on her channel afterwards. Yeah, all this like um, African wild game stuff. Yeah, like you see the guys well, that, she, that, yeah. She, she shoots ostriches and things like that, you know. I mean, mm. what's all that about? Mm. Interesting experience. Mm. Anyway, getting back to you, um, COVID and stuff like that. You've got your jab now then, so you're, you're safe to uh, travel. Then. Yeah, I had the Pfizer one on Tuesday. And, uh, you know, I, I know there's a lot of conspiracies about it, but I thought, like most of us, I like fishing abroad. And I'm thinking, if I don't get that, I don't think... it. No matter what the government says here, I don't think some of the other countries let you go fishing there. So I thought, I, bet, I better have it just to make sure... I've got a passport, you know, and then, uh, so if Bill Gates knows where I am at any moment in time, it's just tough shit. Oh dear. <laughs> how was, um, if he's tracking me. <laughs> <laughs> Frank, how were you in the days after your, your jab? Again, not, not too much into the conspiracies, but I've heard a few people um, falling, ever, just ever so slightly ill after, after having the jab. No, it, I think if you have the Oxford one, you're more prone to being a little bit rough for a couple of days, like yeah. flu symptoms. But but but, but it's, it's protein, isn't it? It's protein. Is it? Is it? Is it? It's a protein from the from the actual virus itself, isn't it? So that's it's, why uh, RNA. There's two different types there. One's RNA, and, and the other ones. Uh, yeah, it's like made some, from some of the proteins and bits of the the makeup of the virus. That's why you get sick potentially, isn't it? Yeah. Well, your body's suddenly uh, full on fighting it. You know, yeah. thinking it's been invaded. Yeah, so, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but yeah. You, you see that as a passport anyway to, to being able to fish, you know, hopefully later on in the year anyway. Yeah, well, I think I think you, I mean, it's all the young people, uh, what are they going to do? You know, my, my lads and, and my daughter have been saying, you know, they're in the 20s and they're going, well, we're not having that, bollocks to that, we're not doing that. I said, so what are you going to do about going to uh, Tenerife and all the rest of it in the sun, you know, you want to have your holidays or come in fishing with me to Italy and Croatia and all that. Well, I guess I'll have to have it then. I says, well, there we are, you know, so you might as well just steam in, get it done, and mm. then it's out of the way. Mm. But uh, it's a shame it's come to that. And you, you, I mean, I, a lot of these people that are refusing to have it, I can see their point of view as well, you know, because you're kind of thinking, there's these scaremongers out there. Where, did you see that one with that old that old woman where she's just shaking all over and yeah, uh, yeah, having that. a fit-like sort of response to it? It is enough to scare the shit out of you, isn't it, when you see that? You're thinking, what if I'm one of them unlucky ones that cops for it, you know? But do you not think it's like that with a flu jab and everything as well, isn't it? It's just... Yeah, uh... well, my, my mum had a massive reaction to the flu jab and it, it, it basically trashed her. And all her throat swelled up, her mouth, and she still gets all this... Uh, like anaphylactic sort of 
symptoms from it, so she can't have it. So that's her knackered for holidays for the foreseeable future, you know. Yeah, it's a shame. shame. It's a, yeah, it's a shame some people do get. I, I guess older people as well, potentially, you know. Yeah. You're not that old yet, Frank, are you? So you, you should be fine. <laughs> no, I'm not that old. You're I'm not still... as old as Simon, mate, as we said. <laughs> I'll tell you what, and I've got some stick, Frank. Yeah. Well, your your hair's a yeah a, a slightly darker colour than mine. I think that's why uh, yeah I seem to get yeah. a little bit more. Yeah, stiff. mine's mine's. <laughs> hey, listen, mine's a bit of technical assistance. So I'm not scared about saying that because <laughs> since uh, Mickey Gray, which is a strange name, isn't it? Uh, admitted that he uses a bit. I thought oh, I don't feel so bad. <laughs> then, <you know? laughs> I never realised that with Mick anyway. I mean, um, I always thought he was blonde anyway. He does so... look like quite a nice natural blonde as he well, does, doesn't he? He does. That was a revelation. Yeah. That was an exclusive, wasn't it, for the podcast? Yeah. That? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, um, I, a purple rinse might have been interesting. <laughs> it might have been, yeah. <laughs> Why don't you try it, sir? You could have a. You could have. You're not going to get. I'm not going to get away with that now, though, am I? Sure I mean, everyone wrong. knows I'm grey now. As soon as I come into work with like brown hair, it's like, what's been going on there? <laughs> I told him, Frank, he needs to go for the full lockdown shave. <laughs> uh, only because he's had the full lockdown shave. Hey, well, <laughs> never mind you, balls. What about your head? <laughs> <laughs> we might as well go for both. You've been fishing a bit during the during the winter, doing all right, Frank, as well on a syndicate lake in, uh, you know. Yeah. So, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, what it is, I, uh, I've I've never had the luxury of a really very good sort of water on my doorstep. Uh, for a long time, normally I'm away doing all the shows in Europe, you know, like Zwolle and Carp Italy and, uh, you know, here, there and everywhere, really. And then there's the English shows, of course, but I, I was excused all that because they were all cancelled, obviously. So I thought, I've got a, a syndicate that I got in, uh, in, in, the, in the, just after lockdown, probably the June I got in it, end of June. And uh, it's been absolutely brilliant. You know, it's got so many features and so much going for it. It's not massive, you know, it's about, only about six acres, but it's it's got depths down to 30 feet. Mm. It's an ice age sort of uh, kettle from 10, 12,000 years ago, like a lot of them tend to be. And uh, I thought, right, I'm going to give it a good crack this winter. And you're allowed, before this lockdown sort of carry on, you're allowed to do 48 hours a week. That's your maximum, which I like because it gives everyone the, the same sort of shot. There's there's thirty odd members in the syndicate. No, I, I I I would say as well. I mean, say a thirty a thirty foot deep lake. I mean uh, that that's deep. I mean, do, does that does that put you off in winter? No, interestingly enough, I uh, you had it was that guy Tom that was on. Uh, Tom Stokes was yeah. Tom Stokes mm. yeah. Well, that water that he was talking about mm. in Shropshire. I, I know of that. I thought it was one of two waters, actually. Uh, but I, I, I know which one it is. And they were in 40 feet of water. And he said that no one, everybody ignored it. And, uh, like, I was watching uh, Dan and do the, the winter session when he went on uh, Gigantica. And uh, he said the fish always sit right in the centre of the, the pool. It's bound to be reasonably deep there, but it makes sense that they go there to get out of the way. And I keep calling, I notice that the fish always huddle together. They want to be really close in the winter, in the cold weather. So it makes sense that a central area where they're not getting leads banged on them, or hopefully, that's a, that's a place where they might go for a bit of sanctuary, you know. So... Tom found the same when he was on that Shropshire water and he started fishing in 40 feet of water. And uh, one of the members was talking to him, my syndicate, he goes, oh, we all avoid it. He says, imagine 10,000 years worth of silt sat in that deep water. And I says, but how do you know it's 10,000 years worth of silt? They might be keeping it clean in certain certain areas. Uh, so... I was led in about and I found uh, some real hard spots and I uh, I tried one in, well, I, tried, I put two rods in it, to be honest with you. Straight away uh, in December, I, I stuck in two rods in the deeps and two on troughs in 12 feet of water and 10 feet of water, just edging my bets, really. And uh, it was just getting into darkness and one of the deep water rods zapped off. And I thought, you know, I'd, I'd put one of the deeper, I've got one of those deeper, the, the chirps. Were you I'd seeing fish on that the, deeper or were you just using that for depth? 
Oh no, I've, I've seen fish on it, mate. Honestly, mm. they're, they're very, very good. It's not an advert at this room. They're mm. excellent. I, I, I was forced to get one because I, uh, I was watching Chris Thompson, a friend of mine. Uh, I know it's going off at the tangent, but it's worth saying mm. this. He was fishing with Ian Sorrell on Parco de la Brenta. And it's pretty featureless where they were fishing. It was like 26 feet of water. Maybe, no, 24, sorry. In peg four. It's flat as a pancake. So there's nothing there. Your bait's kind of a feature or just the randomness of fish coming through, you know. And Chris was, listen to this, he had uh, eight fish over 55 pounds and they're all commons one afternoon, up to about 58 pounds. So I kept going down doing the photos and you could see the waves of fish coming in on the deeper. He cast it out and just let it sit there. And as the fish came in on his side, he was getting bites and when when there was a lull nothing happened so we knew it was the fish hmm. and then they moved on to Ian Sorrell's side and then he'd start getting him and we knew it was coming because the deeper was picking the fish up what's it like once you've used one of those I've never used one and I, I would be scared of using it because I think once once I've I've seen that I would feel that you can't go back then can you really I mean can you can you use it maybe in the winter time but then put it to one side for certain sessions or um... yeah of course of course you can listen in, but, in but the winter... temptation's not always there then I mean I, for me the temptation would always be there to want to keep using it it to me actually yeah, well, sounds if... like the excitement's gone really like you said you knew they were all coming in <laughs> yeah but it's yeah yeah but you've still got to catch them yes and uh, the thing is it's not very exciting uh, when the indicators aren't moving and, and <laughs> yeah, there's there nothing in your swim but you so you're not sure whether you're getting it wrong or the main thing is you're not on fish hmm. you're not getting it wrong you're not on fish so we've got the option to move on parko so you know you've saved up all year it's your special week and you're going oh, i'll just sit it out but the fish not, might not be visiting your swim and with that you soon suss out that the swim's devoid of fish and you can move and then get straight on them. So it has got its uses. I mean, it, it depends what your ethics are and what you, it's all down to the individual. If you want to sit there and bore yourself and not know what's going on, great. And the other way of doing it is just take your buzzers off and stay awake when you're fishing. <laughs> and, and, have you, have you, have you the hook in the bait? So you have to strike. You know, how far do you want to take it? Exactly. You know? Have you have you learnt very much from using those fish behaviour? Where you know where they are in the water, how much they move around in the winter as a consequence of uh, having a deeper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I always realise that the uh, virtually the last place that fish visit is the bottom, and it just happens to be that's where we want to fish as anglers most of the time. You know, so. You just got to look at fishing in an aquarium. They have everything on the top first, and then everything in the middle layers, <clears throat> and then the bottom last, because it's it's all the dirty food and hard works on the bottom. You want all the clean food that's in suspension on the surface where they're not going to get caught. So, I mean, they can get caught on the surface and we catch them on zigs now, but at one time they were completely safe, really, weren't they? And everything in suspension in the middle was perfect, you know. So... I think we're up against it, but if you, the small windows in time, right? I've got my koi out there now, and I've been putting. They won't. They won't take pellets or anything in, in the winter. They won't take maggots. Very slow to take maggots, but they like a little tiny bit of bread. So I'll put bread in, and, and when you're watching them, they won't. It can bounce on the head and bounce in front of them, and they, they won't touch it. And they're all on the bottom, right? And they're all huddled in a corner. If I leave them for 10 minutes and go back, it's all gone. So I started watching them, and uh, there's one catalyst. There'll be one fish that'll suddenly start sucking it in and blowing it out and sucking it in, and then that whatever that's releasing or doing seems to program the others, and then they, they all start. So the koi have learnt me a lot, and the deeper. So you know that for, for once you've found them with the deeper, the idea was to then to just nag them. So I I knew I'd put the bait in their front room, basically, where they're all huddled together and just nag them shitless. I didn't take the rods out and create other baited areas. I, I just left them and sat on my hands for a full 
extent of the day. If I did a day, I'd sit there all day. No recast, no nothing. I thought, I'm on them. And, and bait as well. Would you be putting bait in? I was putting, I was putting more bait in than you might imagine. Yeah. I was, uh, what I wanted in particular was a lot of liquids. I think the liquids uh, stimulates them. You know, it's like you sat there and you can smell bacon and egg or curry or something. And you're thinking, Phew, I'm getting hungry. I'm going to, I'm going to eat. But if, if you didn't smell it, you know, it's, it's not the same, is it? So I thought I'm going to nag them. And then I didn't want a little tiny bit in case any roach or nuisances strips it before it came to feeding time. Cause the feeding windows were quite small and pronounced. So I thought, I'm just going to nag them. I'm going to stimulate them and nag them uh, and just wait for it to happen. I mean, I use an element of maggots because maggots, I've caught tons of fish on maggots, but I also put sweet corn in because fish adore sweet corn. When I was fishing birch grove in the winter, you might not think it, but they chose the sweet corn over every other bait. We, we, we mentioned that, didn't we? Because I, I said yeah. to you before, I don't know if yeah. we mentioned this on the last podcast, but I definitely text you to say to you, why do you, I've personally found that sweet corn is better fished on its own. I don't, for some reason, you, know, you seem to get quicker bites, probably more bites fishing sweet corn yeah. on its own. And you were talking about some observations that you made at Birch yeah. Grove. Yeah, well, what happened was I, there was a, there was a snag tree really where you climbed in the tree and you could see the bottom. It was like an aquarium. So I, I put all the different baits in there, including tiger nuts, which were banned, uh, 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 lots of different baits, big selection. Oh, I didn't intend using the tigers by the way, for a hook bait. I just wanted to see what their reaction was to them. And, uh, I put in, uh, liquidized bread. I put in sweet corn, boilies, chopped boilies. I put in maize, maize and sweet corn and i uh i was catching on fluoros yellow baits mostly uh, which were wafters so i even made some bottom baits in them which i was baiting up with anyhow to to get them so that they're used to accepting wafters in the flavor and the the combination that i'd got so it wasn't all every single one had a hook attached to it or a rig you know that's my way of getting them loosening them up in the winter so you get more bites Anyway, uh, put them in the tray and was was watching, playing a, a video of it actually, uh, and I played it back. And the fish came in, one started, and then I suddenly realised it was just the sweet corn, and they'd left the maize, they'd left the tigers, they'd left the boilies. Uh, there was still maggot in there, and so the corn was the one. And, uh, do you think we're missing a trick a lot of the time then when because a lot of people use corn but they do they do mix it with with other baits so they there could be fish feeding on their beds of bait a lot of the time but just picking yeah. up the corn but not fishing with corn as a hook bait and potentially not getting as many bites as they they could well, be well me and you talked about this didn't we i uh it all unfolded when i used real sweet corn to the rigs and uh mm. as daft as it sounds because it's almost you'd think no, nah, just use use plastic or use uh, maize with a couple of pieces of foam on and that. And it just, it, I mean, I didn't have plastic when I was trying it, I must say. But uh, I mean, that's that's a bit of advice I've been giving recently, actually. When I use the plastic, I, a lot of people use in synthetic flavours to keep it. And I, I get fresh corn juice and sit it in it and change it regular and keep keep my sweet corn, plastic sweet corn, in, in the, the juice you get in the sweet corn. Mm. Tins, you know, mm. and... Uh, that's just a quick tip for you because it does stain them and go into them and all that. But the real sweet corn is amazing. Mm. And you can get that uh, plumber's freeze it spray from freezing pipes down to minus 50. In a split second, you spray it on them. It's like WD-40 size, 12 pound a can on eBay. It's completely safe. It's not dangerous for the fish or anything. That's the first thing I, I, I make clear. So I froze the sweet corn down when I was fishing at a range, not when I was closer. And uh, hey, it works. You, you, you know, it's instantly rock hard. And uh, I behind the pieces of sweet corn, I, I get a piece of uh, clear plastic, maybe of a hook packet or something like that. Trim a little disc out and, and put the the baiting needle through the corn and through the plastic disc, and then I put a boilie stop in. So it's a pressure plate behind the corn, you know. Yeah. yeah. And that stops it getting ripped off, and nuisances can't get it off so easy. Are you using a lot? Of, how many how many grains are you using on a hair then? 
three. Three grains, yeah. Yeah, or else I'll use two and a little piece of foam in between them. What about uh, liquidising corn? Do you like doing that? Yeah, it's excellent. I buy it. I buy cream corn. Uh, Sainsbury's sell it in the, well, I suppose where you get a lot of the, the uh, delicatessen food and that. But have you seen the cream corn? It's about £1.20 a tin. I go through tons of it. <clears throat> it's ready done. And if you want to get one of the best attractors ever, I get the, uh, I liquidise the bread, put it in a, in a blender. It clogs it up a bit, you know. Uh, but you get that white bread's the best and then i liquidize sweet corn or use the cream corn put that in and it's just the most exquisite smell and you can with you know you let it suck in and you can use it in the uh, sticks or in uh, you know in a ball it takes a while to break down as well it's all that attraction of the corn with the bread flake as well you know and i'll tell you what else i like using as a hook bait over that and and importantly, uh, this other thing I've been doing. I don't know if I'm probably thinking too many things at once, but I'll tell you what, what I was doing. I, I was getting a, a wafter mix or a bottom bait mix. You can make it with 50-50, you know, just semolina and soya flour. And uh, you can use some like the Richworth one or whatever, you know. Uh, but a, a bottom bait mix is very good. And then I get some white dye some day glow white I only put a little bit in you don't need much and i i've even got bread flavor and what i do is i, I mix the dough so it's like a, a pop-up or wafter mix and i pinch pieces off it dead rough so it look, looks just like a piece of bread flake and then i, I boil it for three minutes quite a heavy boil <clears throat> and then i dry it out for a couple of three days and you can you can put it on the hair rig easily or you know floss it onto a ronnie rig whatever you want and uh, it's dead effective when you when you put in the mashed bread over the top, or use it with a stick. It's bloody fantastic. You're writing this down, Tope. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing you can do, Sire. Si, right, listen to this. Uh, I had some guys try to take the piss out of me when I was doing it, and I thought, well, you don't know what I'm doing. You know why? Why are you why are you being asses about it? They said, oh, you took up pike fishing. You know. And I had the, the sliding floats yeah. on and I predetermined what depth I wanted to fish at because when you're using zigs, they're fixed in position and you're not covering much ground, importantly. Well, imagine when you, you've got a float out and you're on the back of the wind, the float can meander through the swim. And have you noticed when they're taking mixers and you're using an over-depth zig, it's stationary and static. And if there's a ripple on, they take everything that's moving hmm. and they'll avoid your zig yeah. or your, your, your controller. It's like, if it's, dr it's, if it's, it's like drifting dead bay, isn't it? You know, doing yeah. the same thing. So, so I have the, the float and I come from the top with a pierced bullet on it. And I use, a, a you know, the hook length. And obviously the, the, the imitation bread that I've got sinks. So you get on the back of the wing, small spawn, and then I get the mashed bread and I'm just stopping it in the air and letting it just drop down gentle and putting mashed bread in on top of the, the float that's obviously my target. And underneath that is imitation bread. And uh, wow, it's, it's so effective. And you know when you get that scum line in the summer and you see them tenting underneath, that's an old-fashioned term, mm. isn't it? Tenting. Oh, yeah. Where you see the backs lifting it up, the scum and the weed and stuff, and mm. then a pair of lips come out. Well, if you let it drift into them scum lines, you can guarantee it's just going to go wham straight under. The bites are fantastic, you know. Uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to do. Very active. You can fish it on the buzzers in the dark as well, mm. you know. Still get streaming runs. Fantastic. Yeah. Something, something different, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to film that one day uh, and show it properly, in, you know, how to do it in, in action. It'd be, it'd be really good, that. Mm. You know? Getting back to your uh, your baited spots then, Frank. And so so you were bait you were baiting. So were you baiting like the day before in advance, and then and then and then wait like you say, trying to coax the fish onto it like that. Yeah, if if I was doing day sessions, I'd I'd go and do the day and, and still fish. I wasn't pre baiting. Hmm. Uh, I didn't think it was fair that because there was other guys there and everything, you know, doing their sessions. I didn't want bait all over the place because once I'd realised where they were through the liners and. Uh, 
you know, they were fizzing as well, actually, in the winter. They were giving the location away by lots of little bubbles coming up. And they were active within the confines of the area. They were. And I could get it from different swims, so it was okay. And, uh, yeah, I was I was putting a reasonable amount of bait in, I must say. Mm. And uh, So do you think when they're on it, the, then, are they, are they completely clearing you out, Frank? I think so. Right. Yeah, because... You know, there's a reasonable head of fish in there, and uh, I think even though they can go a long time without feeding in the winter, I think when one it takes one when one starts, I think the others want to have a look, and then it's a chain reaction, and that that's that appeared to be the case. You know, uh, you know what it's like in winter yourself, and you can have those amazing times where you every rod's just ripping off, but it's very rare. Can I tell you about a session? Actually, um, I was fishing on the uh, the Park Lake in Swindon, and yeah. uh, that was in February. And I remember one day I got down there. They the lake had frozen, and yeah. um, they, there's the, the, the diving board. Everybody, anyone that knows the lake, they know the diving board. And it, the fish do tend to like it down by that uh, diving know, board yeah. when it's. Um, yeah. Have you fished that lake? Yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Yeah, I remember now, actually. My, yeah, Mike Wilmot. Mike Wilmot you, was yeah, on yeah. there. I remember yeah. that now. Well, yeah, well, I was yeah. fishing there. And it, 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 the lake had frozen. And, yeah. and, and it thawed out after about three months. It was about 10 years ago. And I yeah. thought that whoever got into that bus stop swim would get a few bites quickly right. uh, because the fish were blocked up down there. So lo and behold, they did. The guy that went in there, actually a friend, caught a few fish straight away. And then yeah. it all went dead. And... Yeah. And I, I'd, I'd noticed like late, uh, earlier on in the year that there was a hard area out in the middle of the lake that I think was like yeah. a, a catchment area. You know, you've got those pipes that go into the water there. Yeah. Uh, they go into the water and you get, and you, I think you get a lot of silt and a lot of debris picking up around those pipes. Yeah, anyway, yeah, yeah. I, I know what you mean, exactly. Someone showed me on a bait boat, they were getting a hard reading on their sonar on their bait right. boats. And I walked right. around there and, and looked at the spot and thought, do you know what, in the winter, if it, if it goes a little bit quiet, I'm going to fish that area. Yeah, so yeah. after they've did, the guys have been in the swim and caught them off the, bus, uh, off the diving board area, uh, I went into the same swim, but I put all three rods out on, the, on, on uh, where I saw the uh, sonar reading. Yeah. And that morning, Frank, it was mild, overcast, yeah. but there were a shitload of cormorants in the swim. And they were diving on me all morning, right? They were diving on me oh. all, all morning. Uh, and a mate turned up later on in the morning and I said to him, I'm not going to get anything to do. I said, the conditions yeah. look pretty good, but there's yeah. cormorants diving. And all of a sudden I started getting liners and I was going, bloody cormorants, bloody cormorants. They're, they're picking up. And my friend said to me, I reckon they're spooking fish. And I said, no, nah, that's the cormorants. Like every time they're done, he said, I reckon they're spooking fish on the bottom. 15... The cormorants do spook the fish. Yeah, I, 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 think, I think this is what happened. 15 yeah. minutes later, I had this beep. I got Neville, so you don't get much of it. <laughs> and the bobbin was just vibrating. It was just trembling. And I said, that's a bite. And I hit it. Yeah. Lo and behold, I had a fish. I caught another free fish that afternoon. And I yeah, think that wow. those cormorants, like diving down on that spot, had just stirred those fish up yeah. into life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to catch three or four fish in an afternoon there is pretty good going. You know? Yeah, fantastic, especially at that time of the year. Yeah, it's that's amazing. it. And then after that, for the rest of, I think, for the, for the rest of the season, because the season finishes on March the 14th, um, I know John Claridge was fishing there. He's a good angler, isn't he? He doesn't doesn't yeah. miss a trick or two. I know that he was fishing out there. And I, the only people that got bites then were the people that were fishing out into that into that area, um, yeah. without putting too much bait out. Every time I saw someone get the spawn out here, no, just don't put any bait out. The fish are just sat out there at the moment, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, well, what what I found there was no cormorants where I, I'd been fishing up until about just after that big freeze up after uh, around New Year. And then after that, they, they must have been starving. And there is two types of cormorants, I don't know if you know that. Dave, uh, who owns uh, Emperor Lakes, is an ornithologist. And there's, there's a, a Chinese type which live in land that escaped, uh, that were meant for a zoo. And then there's this big seagoing version, and they're, they're different sizes. They're a different species. 
So everyone's thinking the sea ones have come in inland because there's no fish in the sea, but mm. they're not the different side. Anyway, I've probably got off a bit of Dave Lidston sort of information now. Yeah. But what it is, as soon as them bastards appeared, my bites in the day were uh, few and far between. I, I went through a bit of a spell where I was struggling, and everybody on the lake was struggling, you know, because they were making a nuisance of themselves. And it's it's hard to get rid of them, you know. Uh, in, in the end, uh, I had to opt for the for the blue light. Let's put it that way. It's uh, there's various things you can use to scare them off, you know. And let's put it this way: the blue one does the business. It, it, I've got a Chinese version, and it's that powerful it'll set a newspaper on fire. <laughs> God <laughs> Almighty! Yeah, I've seen some pretty. You're, yeah, I've seen some pretty potent ones around. <laughs> yeah, you can adapt. You can adapt one that's off. Uh, uh, you know the old. Uh, Oh, what's it called? The the, the laser uh, film show things, hmm. and apparently that's super powerful. That you know, it's classed as a military weapon. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they are. So, yeah, you can buy them, but they're about two thousand quid a piece. Then you know, yeah, that's a bit extreme. A bit extreme. Yeah. So, you, so you said that when you were put it, so so you couldn't get rid of these cormorants. Well, I could in the end. That's why I, I had to. I had to get the the blue lights yeah. sort of shoo them off, you know. Uh, very very difficult indeed. Uh, tough did so, whoop, gone instantly, you know. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm a I'm a bird lover really, but I uh, feathered variety obviously, and uh, I basically uh, wouldn't ever do anything detrimental to them, but I just want them gone, you know. When they're starting to be a nuisance like that, so I just scare them off mm. and. Uh, do you know yeah, what I found in that situation? Actually, once I got once once I caught the first fish, that was it. They were gone. Didn't have any trouble right, with them for the rest know. of the day. Then, well, yeah. Anyway, yeah. So I, uh, I just kept going, mate. I was smashing the ice for four hours at a time sometimes, and then fishing straight afterwards. And it just not doesn't do much for your confidence. Yet somehow I was confident, you know, because I've caught under the ice on different venues and things. And then me and my mate, Mark Tierney, we, we tended to pal up a lot, you know, through the winter. He's a good friend of mine. So we went we went through all kinds of weather. And uh, he's younger than me, so I says, get get the chest waders on, kid, and get in there and smash the, smash the ice around the rod tips in case we get a bite while it's minus five and stuff like that, you know. I saw so some of your Instagram was, footage. Oh, I mean, it was brutal, wasn't it? Some, some yeah. Around New Year and stuff there. Yeah, well, did you see that film I made when yeah. we were on there? And it was like... Oh my god! And I've got all my all my gear was just trashed. It all got fungus on it and that, you know, because it was in and out of the van all the time, getting soaked. You never had a chance to dry it off. So, uh, but you were oh regularly my... catching though. Yeah, yeah. Every every time when it was a decent run, I caught. Yeah, and uh, the culmination was that one that I've just just shared. I mean, I, I wasn't breaking my ass to mention it to the, the other guys because I, I'm always of the opinion that. If I'm not mad on people sitting at home waiting for social media to say the lake's fishing and then turning up. So some of the guys were going, well, we, you, ne you never said much about this. I thought, well, what do you want? Are you a telegram or something? You know, it's, it's like, hey, guys, I've sat freezing my bollocks off all winter and, uh, you know, it's it's been an ordeal to say the least. No, it's happening. Why don't you come and get in the swim so I can't get on? You know, let's let me think about that. You know, mm. so I think some of them are probably kicking themselves, thinking, "Shit, it is possible." You know, I mean, it's got a reasonable track record as well. You know, despite it being quite deep in places. So I just I just carried on, and then uh, it's funny. Mark was fishing with me, and he he was he was very open-minded and he was fishing a lot of spots that I'd never fished and he was trying stuff and uh, it didn't work. But as soon as I found where the main holding area was, I started having them and then I says to Mark, just get in here, you know, get in here. I says, you need to catch one because he hadn't caught one all winter. And then... Did you say the main holding started. area was a little bit shallower? It was on the shelf. It was... It was uh, it was basically copping for a lot of the sun when it came up and was at the foot of a shelf and it was it was 10 feet that was the main catching area mm. well that's so a big was, difference that's a big difference when you're fishing a 30 acre lake isn't it yeah yeah 
but the the thing is, it's it's all about line bites. It's or shows. I mean, the, the I, I I can count on one one finger the amount of fish I've seen roll all winter. Not, <laughs> not. So the only the only way of knowing where they were was was line bites. So, so yeah, I, I had the buzzers set on super super fine, and uh, the the delkins were on the maximum setting. And uh, I, 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 it didn't take much to, to find them in the end, really. And obviously, they were, they were fizzing a bit. So fizzing's obviously the, the visual key. So, so it's you, always worth, you, you know, you might think it's gas bubbles, but it's better than nothing. So it's always worth fishing on those spots. Mm. And uh, did, you always I mean, need the same, did you always need the same conditions to get a bite? Yeah, it, it, it rained. Even though it could be absolutely freezing, but when when it was that sort of windy and rain, and slightly unsettled, I mean, not not on a big easterly or out. As long as the wind was a, a reasonable wind, there wasn't a Baltic wind, a northerly or a, an easterly. You in with a shout, you know. And uh, westerlies were were, were good because hmm. where we live, you know, uh, on the in the northwest, the prevailing winds at times are, are, are westerlies it varies but mm. the westerlies are better and southerlies are obviously better again you know but yeah. uh and it kind of lent it's itself since, to... since the weather's booked up and stopped catching <laughs> always the way isn't it well the bottom's breaking up and all the fish are behaving strange now they're starting to show i've seen them porpoising and doing all sorts they're turning up in the inlet where it's silty and but they're, they're not feeding there they're just browsing in there do you think they act more? Um, they're more extreme like that in those in those deep silty lakes where there is a lot more, um, you know, sort of debris and silt on on the bottom. No, I just I just think I think all fish uh, have got their own little idiosyncrasies, but I think uh, it's the daylight hours change everything. Mm. You know that you you just got to look at the koi again. I know I keep referring to them, but it's it's a very good thing to do keep keep, keep your own fish if you're an angler because you can see instantly out the window when they're picking up and moving and doing stuff and uh you know i think this is a natural time isn't there i mean i, I can't work out what exactly is going on at the moment they've, they've, they've stopped feeding or feeding on what i'm trying and the other guys and uh but it, you know it's coming. There's gonna be, maybe they're just feeding on fly hatches because we're starting getting fly hatches now. So mm. maybe that sort of started getting them doing their own little thing and frog spawns in the water now as well. Yeah, yeah, all so that they, stuff. And I mean, you know, um, with the other ang stuff. with the other anglers putting in quantities of bait. I mean, did they see more bait during the winter than they normally would? No, uh, I, I was watching some of the other guys, and uh, I mean, you you got all sorts really, but I. I one mate of mine came round and uh, I hadn't seen him all winter. We were just fishing at different times. And he, he said, uh, oh, I'm just, I noticed him putting the rods back out regularly, three or four times a day, roving about, you know. And uh, I said, do you want me to scare those tuftings off that are diving on you? He went, there's no need. I says, why is that? I says, they've been, they've been, pissing me off diving on my bait he said there's no need i'm not using any bait so he was just using singles you know mm. so or little bags mm. so and i thought shit if you knew what i was putting in you'd <laughs> i mean i wasn't going mad but it was a lot for what for you know to sit on your hands and just wait it was quite a lot of bait yeah frank i want to bring it back a couple of a uh, couple of minutes you you only briefly mentioned that fish that you just put out on instagram and i think it's criminal that if we don't actually talk about it because it looks epic <laughs> why okay yeah yeah, yeah. was it the 40 pounder yeah and, yeah well, and you caught it on was... some new rods as well <laughs> yeah well what happened was i uh i noticed a lot of the fish were big fish that i caught the average on the lake is probably about 25 pound in the summer and uh i had i had the first one, I suppose, that sort of led to it all was the one I had in the deep water, and that was 31, just under 32 pounds. And then uh, the day before Christmas Eve, I had, because uh, we got a lot of weird weather and freeze-ups, and all, but I had uh, I had a 33-10 and a 25 mirror, 33-10 common. And then uh, it kind of went on from there, you know. But I, I had that 
that 40 pound common it's never been yeah. a 40 before by the way it was his biggest ever weight i think it last came out about 18 months previous at 38 or something and uh i predicted to mark i was going to catch it as well you know the old premonitions oh yeah we've it's heard that oh, yeah. how, how did that one go <laughs> Well, I had it. If it's Mark Turney, it'd be like, I says, Mark, by the way, I'm going to have a 40 pound common. And uh, he went, yeah, yeah, dream on, bang, it happened. So uh, it was great, that. <laughs> Uh, they, 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 those, those fish are crackers as well. They're, they're very distinctive, those older ones, aren't they? With the, I'll tell you what, right, I've been looking at your artwork as well on Instagram, and uh, um, you're a man of many talents, Frank. But the, oh. uh, you know the way that you would draw a classic carp, those carp, they've got that sort of shaped head and everything, those underslung mouths, yeah. haven't they? Yeah. Well, what it is, I, uh, I started doing it in the book for people, you know, and... I was doing them as a as a, a freebie over Christmas, just just to sell a few books, you know, and as a present for people. And then I started getting an avalanche of orders. And when when I was doing for nothing, I was I was whipping through them. It was taking me twelve minutes to time myself for each one. And then I thought I can't just keep doing this. It was just crazy. I got like orders for thirty seven in in a, in a couple of days. I thought fucking I'm spending how, how much are they? They, they were 35 quid. Right. So I got 15 quid for doing the drawings, which is good money, you know, don't, don't get me wrong. But I suppose when I joss it, they might be worth a few quid more, you know, you never know. Mm. Anyway, I got a flood of people. I says, look, I can't keep doing this. It's, it's ebbing into my time. I can't even go bloody fishing. It's ruining me fishing because I've got to be doing drawings in books. So I'll have to make something because my time's obviously as valuable as anyone else's. So I put 15 quid on them, and then obviously I couldn't do a 12-minute job. So my, my sense of pride's got in the way, so I'm getting more and more intricate with them, you know, and it's taking longer and longer now. But So and on, on a when I'm in the mood for doing drawings, some of them are much better than others, you know. You can see, yeah. and they're getting bigger and bigger as I'm getting more uh, carried away, you know. But uh, I'm having good fun doing it. It's, it's, it's great. They look great. We, we want one of those for the studio, don't we, Tobe? Yeah, I think we should get a nice, uh, really blown up one or something like that. There you yeah, go, Yeah, well, I'll do you one. I'll just do you one. What do you... size do you want? Something like a... Uh... Well, we need to we need to A2 fill this we need to fill this studio up a little bit. I mean, we we've been talking about this for the last two years. Yeah, I mean, what hey, size? Boys, I, steady on. Next thing you have you have me on my back doing the single <laughs> one. Yeah. Back the back do you get any uh, Do you get any requests outside of carp in your booth? Have you had any strange requests for drawings or anything like that? Uh, yeah, tattoos. What tattoo requests have you had? Well, people like the carp, and they says, "Well, I do one specifically for them to do to." to doing to carp tattoos you know and uh there was one guy he seen a, i did a picture of a a carp taking a floater off the surface <laughs> and it wasn't one that you would have naturally thought someone would use as a tattoo <laughs> i went to a showdown in uh, brentwood and he tapped me on the shoulder this guy a nice guy there with his wife and he went he's a tattoo artist and he went and checked that out and it's, he's got all chum mixers floating on the <laughs> surface <laughs> the oh god <laughs> Oh, blimey. <laughs> yeah, but those fish that you were catching on that syndicate lake, they were they were, they were were quite typical of the, uh, the, those fish that you draw. They kind of just got that classic sort of carp shape to them. Yeah, well. they've got a lot of them have got underslung mouths yeah. and them sort of real, you know, my daughter, I mean, I, I wish I had it on the phone. Now, maybe I've got one on the phone, I'll show you. Uh, oh, no, I've turned the phone off. Let's not go there because it'll start ringing. But I'll, I'll send you some shots if you want to use them on there and that so people can see what I'm on about. There was one there, and it, it just looked like a vacuum cleaner. It had an underslung mouth, the one that I caught in the deep water. And uh, my daughter says, bloody hell, has it got a name, that fish? And I said, no. She said, you want to call it Henry Hoover? <laughs> <laughs> it, it looked like a vacuum cleaner. It was mad. That's, That's his name now, is it? Yeah. So uh, We were talking, we were looking at... Um, Frank's Instagram stuff, Tobe, weren't we? Yeah, you've we, got to have a look through Instagram. I'm not a great social media guy, to be yeah. honest. But um, I was just being nosy, Frank, and I found some. Uh, I found some brilliant pictures. I'm dying to ask you about. Why not? Found it. Is it, is it right? I found some of you look like you're in some MMA gloves or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah what's, uh, that what's was the secret that behind that? I I used to uh, when I was younger. My dad was a boxer in the Royal Navy. And he did uh, some ABA stuff and that. And he 
He was he was in the Royal Navy for fourteen years, and he used to beat the shit out of me when he came on leave, because <laughs> he didn't want me to be a mummy's boy, you know, with, with my mum bringing me up. So he he says, "Has he done out wrong?" And obviously, I'd done loads wrong. I used to beat <laughs> all the time. So he says, "Right, get the gloves on," and then proceeded to beat seven shades of shit out of me. So it, it made me not scared of violence, bizarrely enough. Mm. And uh, I went to a dead rough school, so I ended up in loads of scraps, and then. I thought I, I got a keen interest in it around the time of Bruce Lee and all that lot. So I I took up uh, kickboxing and I I did uh, dare, dare I say it, I did judo as well. Wow, uh, yeah, it's quite a combination. I done judo. Yeah. That yeah. I don't believe. No, I did do judo. <laughs> I, I I struggled with that. Was it was it you know when you have to throw the person over the shoulder? Um, yeah. I remember we had to do a demonstration on a Saturday afternoon once and uh, this guy, he was way too heavy. I was trying to get him over and I said, look, yeah. in the end I said, look, just go over, just go over, all right. <laughs> <laughs> just not strong enough. Well, 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 I did that. We, I went to the style women's prison. There was all the, uh, it's a women's prison where, you know, it's just exclusively for females. And they had a, they had a judo club there for teaching the prison officers how to fight in case they're ended up wrestling with all the inmates. <laughs> and uh, I, because I lived in the area, the guy who took it was a third Dan, and he, he used to teach at Strange Ways, the men's prison. He used to teach all the, all the prison officers there. And you wouldn't think much of him. He looked like he should have been doing origami or something like that. <laughs> and he would kill you. He was one of them guys, he'd get a grip of you. Next thing, you're flying through the air and you're like, you get a break fall and you're like, I think he's just brought me back. He was one of them, you know. And <laughs> Where did that come from? Quite, he thought I was quite a tough bugger me. You know, he used to say, you can take a bit of punishment, you. I thought, yeah, I've had a good background with that. My dad used to beat the <laughs> shit out of me. So he'd get me out. <laughs> he'd get me out and demonstrate and throw on me. <laughs> What else so, do we see? What what else do we see on Insta? You you still go out with the boys on the town then? You, I see. I see you. Um, didn't you say you were, you went out and uh, you missed your train or something and ended up in um in crew? In crew. Yeah. Oh, that was that was that wasn't this Christmas. That, that was, was the Christmas, Christmas before. Yeah. With all the yeah. boys, yeah, we went out in Manchester and our guy came, my my eldest son. He likes a few drinks and that. He's a bit of a ladies' man, you know. Chip off uh, the old block. Swordsman, let's put it that way. <laughs> And uh, hey, I could tell you a few about that. You know, he was uh, he was giving uh, Yana's eyes uh, girlfriend one, oh, yeah. who uh, was the ex Man United player. Yes. Yeah, Adam Yana's eyes. Oh, he only yeah. found Yanazar, out she yeah. took him in this. She <laughs> took him in this million pound sort of suite in this block of flats in Manchester. You know, with a Corvassi on the door. And she goes in in there. It, it, she was in her own private booth in the nightclub where he met her. And her mate didn't fancy his mate. So he ended up going back. He says, how, how are you affording a gaff like this? After he'd done the deed, you know, in the morning. She says, oh, it's not me. It's my boyfriend that pays for all this. Yeah, that's <laughs> how you play some Man United. <laughs> what, was he playing <laughs> away that weekend, was he? Yeah, he was playing away, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I saw a picture was... where you were Solskjaer as well. Are you, are you a Manchester United fan? Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I used to be friends with... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, I, Frank, I we're going to have to uh, end it there, I'm afraid now. <laughs> he, my dad was a Man City fan. He used to force me to go to watch Man City from being a kid, and I hated it because I, I always felt like I wanted to be a Man United supporter. And uh, anyway, as soon as I was old enough, I started going myself to Man United, and I've been a, a lifelong fan, really, you know, mm. and uh, through thick and thin. And... Uh, what happened was I went in this uh, pub near my house and uh, I've got a Spanish friend who owned it, Frank, which is Paco, his name is, which is Spanish for Frank. And he's right, right character. And he had a pub called King William in Wimslow. So I went in one day and he goes, hey, Franco, come here. I want you to meet my friend, Gabby, Frank. So he turns around, it's Gabriel Hines. He's a Man United player, player of the year for three years. The Argentinian World Cup winner yeah. and all that. Turn around, give me a big hug. Oh, I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. I'm crazy on fishing. So, <laughs> hell. I says, well, I'm a massive fan of yours. So we became friends. What a, what a guy. He was fabulous. And he invited us to uh, meet all the players in the players' lounge a couple of times. Wow. So guess what we did for a surprise? Ardy Velkamps, my Dutch mate, he's, he's a mad, you know, Man United supporter. He's got his Dutch team, but he 
he he likes Man United. So he said, oh, mate, it's my dream to go to the Theatre of Dreams and watch Man United one time. So me and, me and Franco and Gabby got together and we, we secretly arranged for him to meet the whole team in the players' lounge. He had a football, his shirts and everything. So this is gospel truth. I took Hardy, he says, bring your camera. And he, and he, he didn't know that uh, we'd done all this. So we're watching him play. I think they were playing uh, Aston Villa. So they won 2 0, and Van der Sar was coming off the pitch. And I know, I know Irwin because his son was in the same team as my lad. And uh, so he's coming off the pitch, and Hardy couldn't resist it. He went, Goy, Van der Sar, hello, <laughs> Van der Sar. And Irwin, here's the Dutch voice, turns around because we're right at the front. And he goes, Doi, hello. <laughs> so Hardy went, Hey, did you see that? Van der Sar just waved and said hello to me. I says, oh, keep your hair on, you, you bald bastard. I said, you're beating him in a minute. He goes, what? All the stewards opened up the, the gates and we followed the team and went up the tunnel. And Arnie was giving it the big one, waving to all the crowd and that. It was hilarious. Amazing. And then uh, Ronaldo came out and gave him a big hug and me and... Ah, oh, we got the special treatment. It was mega, you know. That was really when nice. they were. That's when they had a decent. T- I'm a Man United supporter. Well, oh, yeah. I, I well I used to be. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, know I used to go to games and stuff, but um, yeah. but uh, yeah, yeah, that's a good story. Uh, you were talking about um, John Baker came on, and we were talking about um, bait. Surprise, surprise. And yeah, well, uh, we well, had a John's little. An old mate of mine, yeah. yeah, I know, and he's written in your book and stuff as well, hasn't he? It, it, he's going to be a great. Get, we will get him in the studio to do a podcast because he's um he's got a lot to talk about. But yeah, I know that he I know that he mentioned pH in Bates, yeah. and um, yeah. you've got your own opinions on that as well, haven't you? Yeah, well, you told me that, that JB had uh, been speaking to a, a bit of a scientist, and he he said that pH makes no difference. It's a car panger as well, but he. He, 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 you told me that he, uh, he said that pH doesn't register with fish mm. uh, or anything like that, you know. And I thought I'd have to disagree with that one because John's John's come round to that way of thinking, hasn't he? You were saying mm. that he thinks that the pH has nothing to do with. Well, I think uh, John was just passing on what he'd heard from this other guy. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Obviously, because I think I think I mean, I'd have to speak to John to see what he thinks about that and hear it verbatim, you know, from the horse's mouth. But what I know is uh, when I was conducting my experiments uh, in the early days when I was really messing about a lot, I, I found that the pH was quite a quite a hell of a signal, to be honest. And I, I only based it on getting the indicators moving, you know, because I used to use, on purpose, very alkaline attractors and flavors in, in one bait and i'd use a very acidic one in the other and then i'd find something that was about seven as a neutral and sometimes i would use substances that weren't a flavor or anything they were just uh, an element that would create a, an acidic like uh, you know citric acid it's very acidic so i was using that in a in, in a bait that had no flavor in or anything and using a, a very alkaline uh, mixture in another bait and seeing if it had any kind of response. And if you used a placebo that was a neutral, that was very rarely the one that got picked up. So, but importantly, this was in dark, not in daylight. So there was no visual sort of cue. Fair it test. was in the dark. So I tend to think a lot of things show more in the dark. So if you've got a a single hook bait that's going to be... If you're getting bites on a single in the dark, let's put it that way, you know you've got some serious attraction in that single because singles are crap in the dark. Really crap. Mm. Uh, for a number of reasons, but if they... If if you get a single that's working in the dark, that that is a massive... Have massive... you got any colour f- uh, preference for, 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 for fishing singles in the dark? Or do you find white. that with all... White is the best, yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. White is David Attenborough did uh, Super Sense program. You can still get it on YouTube, I believe. And it showed a cyprinid, which was goldfish, in, in a enclosed studio with no no light. So he got a white top on, and he was behind this door, and he feeds it this this technician, and he always has his white top on. 
So he turned the lights out. So it was it was like a, a coal bunker, jet black. And he came out from behind this partition and the goldfish got all excited. It, and it showed what the goldfish could see. The goldfish could see in the uh, infrared spectrum and could see the white jacket that he'd gone. So it thought it was going to get fed and was getting all excited. Mm, mm. And then, so I knew that carp do have infrared vision. And so if you use something that's white in the dark, you're going to get more bites than if it's not. So I used to take... I might have a, a red fish meal, you know, like with Robin Redding and all that. And I, I ignored that, left a lot of the elements out of it. Even though I did the fish meal, it was like dark brown with some, you know, or it could be pink. But I was putting tons of day glow white in to try and get it white. Sometimes it was very pale pink. And uh, that definitely, definitely caught me more fish in the dark. It's absolutely without any doubt whatsoever, you know. Sometimes it's worth switch into a white bait regardless of anything else if you're fishing over a load of particle or other boilies just as an absolute tactic for night fishing mm. is which same smell of you know you could do a you could do it alternative so but if you make it white more bites at night simple as that but but generally speaking if you're fishing singles at night you are looking more for an attractor profile rather than a specific color that's more important to you. Yeah, but I think a lot of the places where you would fish a single at night is usually at extreme range where you see fish showing in the day where you can't really bait up mm. unless you're an extreme caster. And, <clears throat> you know, you can put a spawn mm. 180s or something. So you might be banging a single out there. Uh, but but what it, inevitably you'll find, it, if there's a safe area where they don't get fish for, they've stripped it bare. There's no food there, nothing. So you get a very fast pickup in the day when they're staying out of the way. But inevitably, a lot of people quieten off in the dark. They'll do the rods before dark, maybe an hour before darkness, get the reds down or be drinking or sat in the bivvy, and that's the rods done for night. So unless the fish inevitably have got no food where in that sanctuary, so what they'll do is they'll, they'll migrate into the margins where there's, or, you know, near in which is where you catch them off, off on the baited area in the dark. So, you know, my my thing is a lot of the singles have just not, they've got the pulling power, but they're in the wrong place. Right. You know, that's why at night time, if you leave them somewhere you've seen fish, the fish often move to a feeding zone in, you know, in the dark. So that's you, what I found. So you would rather pull singles into shallower water Closer, I, I closer, sure. closer in, put, yeah, back towards, back towards you. Yeah, yeah. On on areas that see more bait, where you uh, or fish them over bait. Yeah, not as a single. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. You know? And yeah. uh, so the so the pH and the the attractors in in baits. Then you were talking about that. Yeah, well. Because I mean, I've, I've, sorry, I, I've always, uh, yeah, we we always hear your pH in bait, but a lot of people don't necessarily understand. What is what is pH in, and 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 how much power over hydrogen isn't it? But but how can it make a but how can it make such a difference to um, you know a, a, a fishing bait? Well, what it is is if you've got a, an inlet, for example, uh, you fish in a lake that might have a pH of seven point six, which is almost neutral, neutral seven. So it's neither acidic or alkaline. It's just in the middle on the scale. And then you've got a, an inlet pipe from a stream that's got chalking, for example. So that chalk will be alkaline. So it might have a pH of 8.2, 8 for example, because it's more alkaline. And that will suddenly flood the river and break into the lake. And the carp instantly know that... There's other water coming in because the pH is different. And then they'll race over. One, it's a way out of the the environment where they are because they're naturally nomadic and they want to move to other places, mm. which is what they do in a flood. Mm. And two, it's a message to say there's flood water coming in that's probably got worms and other food that's being washed into the lake. So they're very acutely aware of pH. 
as a way of finding food. They've mm. evolved to do that, you know. So you're doing it on a different scale in bait, you know, because it's it's a, it's a different thing entirely. I mean, it, if you do, I, I read some of the studies and uh, that the Americans were doing with with a, a placebo pellet. It was a basic cart pellet with hardly any oil in, and they used it in a tank that had a little tiny floor of water so the, the floor of the movement of the water would go to those carp and they them carp were wired up and they registered the chemo reception that as it went through the nares and the stimulus the stimuli that the carp were receiving and when they put citric acid in which is uh, a very low ph they were stimulated instantly so if they don't detect ph how were those carp being stimulated by uh, an acidic substance? And the same happened when they they they, they put uh, sodium chloride in, which is salt, and there was some stimulus, but nearly five times more stimulus was the uh, uh, basically like Epsom salts. It was the very alkaline version, and it was calcium chloride. So it was the calcium version. Like a, yeah. And there was a pronounced effect when they put that in. Nearly five times more response. We, we, so I don't use sodium chloride to, to spruce my baits up. I use calcium chloride. And calcium chloride is what you find in horse licks, isn't it? That you buy in these, these yeah. yeah, these, what do they call them? Tax shops or whatever. they. And, and, and we, we, I mean, having koi in your pond there, you must... Um, you must watch their reactions to, to blocks of that in the water as well, because it is um, it, it's noticeable, isn't it? When you put that in the water, the reaction that they uh, they have to they just sort of hover over it, don't they? And it's like, well, what are they actually? Well, it ionizes into the water and gives off an area of attraction. Yeah, yeah. And, and the thing is, say, si, if you if you think about uh, these these cues that cause a reaction and them to be stimulated you know alcohol does it we know about that you know uh, mark holmes is always talking about that and when you i mean I, I used to use fermented particles you know particularly the maize and i was putting yeasts in and stuff you know like brewer's yeast to to, to speed up the reaction and sugar and that was giving off almost neat alcohol yeah and it worked a dream yeah. it was fantastic yeah you I know Pigeon conditioner was good for that as well. You could, because you, you could just scold it quickly, put a lid on it, and it would, it would ferment pretty quickly as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Or that so was, there's, yeah. There's lots of things that are, 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 are altering the pH. You know that Kevin Nash whiskey flavor, for example. That was one thing that was a hell of an attractor. It was brilliant in singles, but if you overdid that slightly, it, it, it'd go dead. But that was very acidic. Very acidic. Is there, is there, should we be adapting um, our baits to the pH of the water that we're fishing, or are we pretty much safe just using a standard? Because you hear this as well, don't you? I, I hear this. Oh, certain baits, oh, they don't work here. They don't work there. And I mean, is there anything in there? Is it, I mean, could the pH just be a little bit out on the bait, or um, is that just an old wives' tale? No, I, th I think sometimes people, people, uh, read too much into it i think it's i think most baits are pretty decent nowadays you know if, if you if you do the the right things and find the fish first and uh, you know you, you're careful with the way that you introduce it uh, i mean i've never seen many people do really well turn up and just put 10 kilo out and then suddenly start hauling you know it's just you, gradually you build on it don't you but the, the bait itself unless you've cocked up I mean, primarily what you'll be meaning is people that have made their own baits because that's where you might liably cock up. Right. I used to see it, you know, I used to roll bait at Trevs of Wimslow and people, them days, rolling bait was more commonplace, you know, hmm. for yourself. And people used to go in and choose mixes and they'd, they'd, they'd pick some essential oils from nutrients and then dream up a dosage. Hmm. And I'm like that. Fucking hell! This is gonna this is gonna blow your head off. Mm. Cost a fortune and blow your head off, and the fish's heads. Because mm. if it's blowing mine off, <laughs> and fish have got ten times more taste buds and you know super sense, what's it gonna do? Uh, that's a 
guys, you don't really want to be doing this. And every time I predicted that it would be a disaster, you know, they're back and going, no, oh, it's not worked. I thought, well, you know, jo- high jo- levels high levels for singles and for food, low levels. Yeah, I mean, and, and John Baker said this so well on our podcast as well. Yeah. You know, there's an awful lot of trial and error there to, to, to get these combinations and these levels, you know, ju- just just right as well. You see, JB, as much as I love him, uh, we, we do clash on some things because he, he's he been preaching to keep all your levels of your attractors low in single hook bait, which whilst I can see that a little bit, it's like uh, it's already a needle in a haystack job if you're not careful. So like I said, if you, you know, unless you're not intending using them in the dark, they're, they're soon washed out anyhow. So there's virtually nothing in there. Some people say, oh, yeah, washed out is better. But it's so easy for fish to miss them because like we already alluded to earlier, the fish are in the upper layers most of the time. So, you know, if if you're expecting to find a single hook bait, uh, you know, okay, a lot of the time you'll think it's just on the colour, but you need everything you've got in that bait to drag them down or to, to draw attention. What about what about the opposite then? I remember going to uh, Gigantica um, ten years ago or so now, and I rem- actually moved in after Ali, and uh, yeah. I remember hearing that Ali had put a lot of bait out uh, midweek, and yeah. uh, and the fish had. St- they hadn't gone anywhere near that for well until the Saturday morning, pretty much. And then they got on the bait, and I know that Ali caught a few fish um, yeah. after that. Could you do, do you think that you can actually put too much bait in, and and actually completely fr- the, the the dosage is in the water is just too high for the fish to want to go near, and they're, and they're waiting for that bait to uh, they're waiting for those attractors to leak out before they go near it. It depends. It, it, it all depends on that if you've gone over the top with it. And that, knowing what Ali was using, I don't think it's that no, because it would have been mainline, wouldn't it? And you know they will. They will have. They've got a set sort of acknowledged. So even thought. a bit. So yeah. So even though obviously the the bait is fine, the way the bait's constructed, but just putting a large quantity of bait into a small area of water, you don't think that 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 would deter fish. Potentially. Yeah, but so you don't know how much bait had been picked up successfully before it kicked off. You don't know you that. Know, no, we're, know. We're, just, we're just we're just theorising on that, and it was like, oh, I, I wonder why it took him so long to get those bites. And like you say, it might have just been that they were on it the whole time, and they they cleared the swim, or or was there something else? Yeah, well, don't forget, they probably started round the perimeter of his bait, and he will have been at, at right his in the middle. <laughs> Put it all perfect and have them in the middle of the minefield. <laughs> yeah. When it, the fish have probably taken three or four days to actually work the way through to the middle bit. You know yeah. what I mean? Well, that, I mean, that's a logical theory, isn't it? That that's, that's what's yeah. happening. But uh, um, yeah, you don't. Yeah. Think, but I mean, yeah. so, so the answer, the answer is uh, if you put a load of bait in, you nag them and you might have to wait. So, but it, and then where's the equation? This is partly a skill of fishing, isn't it? Gauging how much to put out and where and when and when not to, when to sit on your hands and all the rest of it, you know. Yeah. One doesn't fit all, does it? There's all different scenarios, you know. You can never really guess everything and get it right, you know. No. No, you can't. Um, talking of spots and stuff as well, you uh, you were mentioning. Actually, I looked at that on your Instagram post, uh, Parco uh, Parco Del Le. Uh, you were clearing. You were in a swim, and there was a snag on the bottom or something. This is going back a while, isn't it? And you uh, yeah. you got the bailiff to clear the snag off the bottom. But you've also spoke a little bit to me before about clearing spots, clearing spots before you actually fish on them anyway. Because oh yeah, well what what happened was. Uh... I fished it tons, you know, because I run the trips there and everything. And uh, we went in peg twenty. Me and Pete Holehouse, who's a real good mate of mine, and we're using solid bags and we're having a lot of fish. You know, we had we had. It was fishing slow, but we had uh, we had quite a good result. We had 10, 10 50 pluses and a couple of sixties, and tons of forties. And uh, we, we were losing fish throughout the session and there was two snags that we worked out. So we knew exactly where the position was and when the fish were running into it and we couldn't stop them because they, they were fighting ever so well, you know, we're mental, the fish. And uh, we says, we need to get them out and do something about this because 
I just lost at what felt an absolute tank. So they said, oh, no, there's no snags in there. We, we send out Ricardo with his diving gear on and he's not found it. I says he's missed some, mate. Honestly, <laughs> trust us. So they went out in a boat with a what I can only describe as a 30-foot pole with a grappling hook on the end, lift this stump up, nearly pull the boat under, and it was, you know, proper big stump, and it had 300 leads on it, markers, dozens of markers, swim feeders, you name it, and about 50 mile of line, including braid, which isn't allowed. <laughs> Maybe it was off markers and stuff, I don't know, but, uh, oh, there was so many. Th- and it's bound to have killed fish. Yeah. It had to have killed fish where it's tethered them, you know. So they were shocked when they got it out, and you should have seen it. I took photos of it. I bet they were glad to get that out as well. Blimey. Yeah, but there was another. They couldn't get it out. It's too big. Mm. Need need a a, a crane to get it out, so God knows what that's got around it. But uh, you were saying about the... uh, Did you say... Was was it a guy fishing on Rainbow Lake, uh, Frank, that you say he was very, very meticulous about clearing his... I don't know if it was Rainbow or not. Very, very meticulous about clearing his his spots before... um, before fishing on them yeah well I, I used to fish rainbow in the winter a lot uh, not a lot spasmodically i suppose now and again because you won't let me go on in the summer you know you gotta be part of the special click i suppose don't you and uh anyway I, I i was there and paul hunt was on who used to run trips you know he used to take like 10 15 guys out regular most weeks and he had all this equipment at the side of his bivy and i was thinking well what the hell's that? It looked like a chimney sweep. So he's got all them attachable rods and uh, brushes and rakes and hose and all sorts of shit. I thought, what's all that about? He says, you don't think I'm just going to put the rods out on my spots in my swimming? In peg 19 it was. He says, when I'm fishing on a load of crap that someone else might have put in, it'll ruin my week. He says, it's too valuable my time. He says, I don't want to fish on a load of crap. He says, so I'm going to sweep the, sweep the features. So I said, this I have to see. So he went out in the boat and he, he did a proper cleaning job on the bottom, you know, whoop, really busy and uh, beavering away, cleaning cleaning all the stuff and sweep. You've got a lot of shelves there where it drops yeah, off. Yeah. So he was fishing on the shelves and making sure they're all swept and clean before he put his bait in. And what, thought, sort of, and what, and what was the result of that? Yeah, he was catching fish regularly, mate. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very successful, yeah. Do you think... Because he was we... on it all the time. He, he knew it like the back of his hand, you know. Do you but think if we could do that more could... regularly? I mean, if we could do that, potentially, I mean, you, we'd be catching more fish, I guess. Yeah, well, the, you, you must have seen all these times when rotten bait pops up and everything, you know, where someone's got it badly wrong or the fish just haven't encountered it. But can you imagine the amount of times when... You know, you get everything right except there's a load of gash bait in the swim before you get there, and you know you you've not got many ways of finding this out, have you? No. Uh, but I, do you know what? I remember when uh, I was fishing Swan at Bluebell, and this is why Tony banned maggots. There was one one guy putting thirty gallons of maggots in every time he fished, uh, which is a crazy amount. Yeah, he, he knew someone at a maggot farm. So you could cast randomly anywhere and you'd get it back in your leaded smell of uh, ammonia off the maggots and you'd have probably a maggot impaled on the point of your hook. Yeah. It was just crazy, you know. Yeah, yeah. That's the yeah. problem with maggots, isn't it? I don't think you need to use maggots in the in the quantities that um, you would necessarily think either. I know, um, you know, seeing people, friends using them, that 30 gallons of maggots is, is ridiculous, isn't it? And, and like yeah, you say... I mean, the guy the guy was catching, you know, but it was like... Because I suppose he was doing a week or something, you know. Yeah. And uh, imagine the price of all that bait on top of your ticket. Yeah, exactly. But, I mean, imagine if everybody else on the lake was uh, following suit as well. And uh, and, and well, then you... Unfortunately, and... unfortunately, a lot of people think uh, the more you put in, the more you catch. Mm-hmm. And like you say... In my book, I actually showed three PVA bags, mesh bags. Uh, one was the size of a 10p piece with maggots in. One was uh, like a ping pong ball, and then one was a, a bigger one, you know. And even the small one's got a real good mouthful when it's all exploded out and that, you know, you, you catch fish all day long on that, mm-hmm. you know. And uh, 
So you're right, you, you don't have to go crazy with them things. You know, yeah. a couple of pints is enough, really. I mean, Malin's Magaliner rigs, you know, they were uh, they were quite well publicised, weren't they, about 10 years ago? He's just chucking those out. He seemed to be doing all right on those, didn't he? That seemed to yeah, start yeah. a new trend, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, it did. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, that's... Well, a no, people still use that now. I don't I think, think so. That would be my go-to. That would be my go-to. If I could, if it wasn't at range, you know, 50, 60 yards or whatever, because yeah. I mean, he was checking out fairly big size PVA bags as well, wasn't he? But yeah. but it was so simple, the, the way he was fishing. I think he was even fishing maggots on the hook as well. And uh, yeah. it's... Um, yeah, it's just the maggot liner with two on the hook or three. Yeah, I mean, if you're I mean, if you, if you start, if you're spawning maggots out, you've got to be bloody accurate. I know... Um, demo doing it and he's very very meticulous about waiting waiting for the wind to drop and doing it at the right time of the day and i mean every single cast he makes is like right on top of each other you know but you've got yeah. to be quite accurate if you're doing it like that but with those bags you know it's um you know you can um you you don't need to worry about that quite so much do you um no. you've got you've got a presentation right frank crikey that's is that an hour and a half tope yeah coming up to it we've got yeah just under <laughs> four hours our last podcast yeah, no, this is this is a breeze, this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, very informative. There's a lot of info in there, a lot of stories. Again, again, though, I feel like we've just whazzed through everything, you know, rather than rounded on it and done it. But but that way, it, it, it's pacey, and it people people might get something out of it that sort of where it resonates and thinks, hey, do you know what? That's worth a try, you know. So that's that's what it's all about, isn't it? You know? I, I mean, talking for to, to guess personally, I, I prefer those type of conversations rather than yeah. rather than having a conversation where you have to sit and listen. And you know, we all like a story. Um, yeah. And and if somebody's in the middle of telling a story, you don't want to break it up, do you? So you're going to let them, yeah. you know, give them a bit of space there. But no, I like this stuff. I like going off on tangents because you get you get information that you wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. And uh, with you, if we. Um, We've got to take advantage of you when you come on as well, because... Well, I'll tell you what, it's, it's like with you, it's like uh, I'm with my mates in the pub, really, you know, and we're just sort of chatting about whatever comes up and that. It's really nice. I enjoy it. It's a good format. There are different ways of doing podcasts. And yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, that there, there are three types of guests on these podcasts. You've got, you've got interviewees, people that are good at answering questions, You've got um, you've got good conversationalists that are good, good just having a conversation like this, yeah, yeah. and then you've got talkers and storytellers, and um, yeah. you know, and I think there's room for everybody, you know, on podcasts. Yeah, I think but, um, too. It's, it's, you've got a good mixture. I must say. Yeah, you 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 need you need a mixture, you know. But um, always appreciate you coming on the show. I've, I've said it to everybody. Oh, well, It'd be nice to see you in the studio again at some point. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to. And yeah. then <clears throat> what I wouldn't mind doing is bringing. A load of uh, rig stuff and that and showing you some of the things I've been working on and things like that, you know. Yeah. I'm sure we can sort something out, get it in the diary for when COVID starts to calm down a bit. Yeah. Oh, I'd love to. I'd love to just come and see you anyhow, you know. And while we've seen some of these rigs recently as well, so there's more rig stuff to talk about. Is, uh... yeah, 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 yeah. But I think yeah, the thing yeah. with you, Frank, is um, you're very, very knowledgeable. You're also very, very easy to talk to and it's very, very easy to ask you questions. Tobe was saying earlier that... Um, you know, he likes to try and maybe ask a few more questions and, oh, is it a stupid question to ask? But actually, I think the stupid questions oh. are sometimes the best questions, the yeah, naive no, questions. No, no. And, uh, <coughs> no, I like Tobe coming in as well, you know. Oh, <coughs> thank you, mate. Yeah, we all love yeah, Tobe coming in. Um, yeah, so like I say, yeah, w when you can, yeah, you're always welcome to come in the studio. And um, we, might even, we uh, might even be able to go for a pint afterwards as well soon. Hey, yeah, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? God, yeah. blimey. We'll have yeah, a nice... <laughs> down for three days and we'll just go on the piss and have that's, a right, we're, that's what I mean we'll have a ten minute podcast and that's it we'll just go to the pub for six hours that will be, that will be a shock to the system yeah. that will after uh, <laughs> yeah, li li liberal drinking for the last 12 months bit, bit of unwinding though isn't it yeah, yeah. let's do it yeah we should do we will do Frank thanks very much for coming on the show pleasure thanks, again, thanks again mate good luck to everyone have a fantastic year for all the fellas watching and that and ladies as well now we're getting more ladies for you. So, <laughs> thanks fellas Lovely thanks very much you. Frank cheers Frank all the best. Thanks. See you soon. The Thinking Tackle Podcast.